Thank you, Marilyn. All right. You got me turned on there? I didn't have me turned on down here, Paul, so. Good morning. Well, I need to have everybody sign visitors' cards today. <laughs> How many of you feel like that? Oh, my gosh, it's been crazy weather. Um, and, of course, we have to take up the offering four times. And i got three sermons to do, so get comfortable. <laughs> no, actually, um, we've managed, but boy, what crazy weather. Um, and and it's, like, it's like always on Saturday night, right? <laughs> um, so I don't know who's praying to sleep in, but you need to stop it. <laughs> uh, in today's service, uh, there are a couple things... And I'll, I'd kind of do our little, my little introduction thing first, um, and that is that, that for, for three weeks, we, we've deferred it until today. It's actually been in the bulletin for about three or four weeks now. Um, but, the, the, you know, we're, we're trying to go through the decades with the music, and so this, this week was, well, three weeks ago, was going to be the 1890s, and we decided to just hang on to it till we got here because we wanted to have have so people were part of it, and I don't know if I have all the pieces anymore. I've got most of them, but uh, when we sing these hymns today, uh, not the opening one, but the, but the one Jim leads in our invitation hymn, uh, I think it's kind of interesting what some of these hymns are in light of what was going on in the 1890s as I went back and looked. I, I didn't know too much about the 1890s, uh, except that they used to call them the gay 90s because of all the parties and stuff. But they said that that was a, a period marked by a severe economic depression because they had a, a panic, a, 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 like a run on the bank sort of a thing, and that there were strikes all over the place. Um, there was there were, uh, the, the st steel industry and, and uh, uh, newspapers went on strike against Hearst and Pulitzer, and coal workers were on strike, and rail workers were on strike. Uh, there were revolutions taking place in a lot of countries around the globe during that time. So it was kind of a, a crazy time. Uh, and when you think about some of that craziness and some of the hard things that they were dealing with, and then we look at the hymns that we're going to sing today, and they were written in the midst of it, I think it's kind of cool. Other things that happened in the 80s and the 90s, this was when uh, everybody headed up to Alaska for the, for the gold. Oh, wait, that is that video up there, isn't it? Yeah, I'm sorry. Stick it up there, Paul. Yeah. Let's see what we got. Yeah, there's the Klondike Gold Rush. That, that, was, that was in the 1890s. What's the next one you've got? Because I don't have them marked on this one anymore. Yosemite became the first national park back in the 1890s, or became a, a national park. I don't know if it was the first one or not. Um, what? Yellowstone was first, right. Um, that's right. I, that's why I hesitated because I'm going, no, I think Yellowstone beat it. Um, let's go to the next one. Uh, this, this is uh, who? Huh? Yes, it's John C. Fremont. And he died in 1891. So that's why we have him up there. Who else you got up there? Who's that? Sherlock Holmes appeared in the Strand with the uh, writings of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. What do we got next? I don't remember which guy that is. <laughs> I had, a, huh? Kavanaugh? No, that's good. It's either. I can, oh, wait, oh, oh, no, I do know who that is because I remember putting it in, in the biblical or religious world. Uh, this is uh, Sir Flinders Petrie, uh, and he was the guy that, that kind of founded modern archaeology. Uh, with him, there was a, there was the, he did uh, let's see he did the first scientifically performed archaeological dig in Palestine during during that time. He he he's the guy that that did the excavation at a place called Tel El Amarna, where they found a zillion little clay tablets that have a lot of information uh, biblical history. Uh, he also uh, in 1896 found the I can't say this. But Oxyrhynchus papyrus in Egypt, a, a, an early papyrus, early manuscript of the New Testament was found. Uh, he also found, go to the next one, this. It's called the Merimptos Stila. It, it's, a, it's a monument for this, this uh, uh, Egyptian pharaoh guy. But this 
is the, is the first reference that anybody has to Israel. Uh, that, 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 that thing that he found in, in 1890, what was it, 1896. Um, and then the next one, the other thing that they found was, he found was a, a Madaba map. If you've, if you've been on a tour to Israel, so I know some people went a few years back, uh, but over on the Jordan side, there's in this, in this chapel, somewhere uh, not, awful, not that far from where Moses left on, on Mount Nebo, in the, at the front of the chapel, there's a, there's a big mosaic. And that mosaic that they discovered was a map of the Holy Land. And it has it, and this is it. And, and actually, one of the interesting things I remember is on the left end here, that little, there's kind of a brown and white circle with a black line through it. That black line was Hadrian's Pillar that was at the end of a street in, in uh, Jerusalem. And, and that's really the only record they have of it, but they found it just a few years back, a few decades ago. So that was, an, so see, there's lots going on. Uh, Sitting Bull died during this time. Uh, Lizzie Borden was accused of swinging her axe. Um, uh, Alfred Nobel, inventor of dynamite, set up the, in his will for the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, in 1894, anybody know what happened in 1894? Somebody might be a buff on this one. I didn't know this. That's when the first modern Olympic Games began. And they began in Athens, Greece, of course. So, you know, a lot was going on. That's also, uh, 1898 is when uh, the USS Maine exploded down in Cuba, and then Teddy Roosevelt charged up San Juan Hill with his Rough Riders. And the other thing I think that's kind of a neat Christian thing, or an interesting Christian thing, 1892 was when Charles Spurgeon completed his 38-year pastorate at Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. He passed away that year. Uh, and he was certainly a, a life-changing force during those times. So that's some of the stuff that was going on. Uh, the hymns that we sing today, uh, one of them is, uh, is actually a... Uh, written by a pastor, I think it's the, the second one, uh, Cushing, I think. That's Spurgeon there. Um, and we're done with that. You can dump it. Um, I think. Go to the next one. Did we have, I don't think I stuck, I did stick one in. That's right. Um, they had a, this, this is a bulletin or a little program from our church in 1896 that we have. They had a, 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 a little sociable, a sociable not fun food and fellowship, sociable. And they went whether it snowed or not, Mary. Um, what's the, go, I think we did the, did I do the inside of it too? And, they, and these are the prayer meeting topics that they had. The family altar, why am I a Baptist, and help and temptation. I think we got one more slide of stuff. Yep. And they celebrated, interestingly enough, the important 28th anniversary of their church. Now, why 28? Who knows? I, you know, I, we, I don't, you, you haven't ever found anything else. Why? We, we've not been able to figure it. But they made a big deal of it. Um, uh, there was a lot. They had a big, fancy celebration. Lots of things going on. I don't know if I put the next one in or not. Yeah, part of it was they, were, they also went out of debt that year on the building. So they, that may have been why they did the 28th. I don't know. But anyway, so we've got some of that stuff around. And that's, that's part of what... Uh, what we wanted to let you know. And then the writer of our second hymn, the, the, I th I'm pretty sure it was him, was a preacher who wrote like thousands of hymns. And, but it says that only a couple are still in use today. So, you know, it's kind of the, the fading thing for a time. All right, that's our fun stuff. Some announcements real quick. The women's little thing, you've got the flyer in here. That's really good. Hang on to it because you'll need it next week because they're not meeting this week. They bumped it to the, to the following week. So don't show up this Thursday. Show up next Thursday. Um, and then uh, there's uh, also something we want you to mark. I'm, I'm taking a lot. We didn't. Our little thing didn't work earlier. And, but on the inside flyer, inside fold of your bulletin, down at the bottom, March 30th, mark that. We're going to have a, uh, a, we're going to do a, a special day of, of spiritual growth stuff and encouragement one another, kind of a calling it a time to refresh and renew and re something else. I don't remember. Noel, I have to tell us, uh, but you'll find out more about it. It's going to be kind of, kind of like from. It's going to be here at the church from like nine to three. There's going to be workshops on topics. Robin 
Uh, Stu is going to come and share some stuff. Uh, but mark that on your calendar. That's going to, and, and, and that's something where for some people that, that are, are at a basic level, I've had some people need some basic help with Bible or with uh, prayer. We're going to try to address that. But there's also going to be stuff for people that are on down the road a little bit. And so we encourage you to, to make that a, an important priority for you. As a matter of fact, March, you ought to make the whole month of March a priority because there's a lot going on. Next week, gosh, I'm talking a lot. I'm sorry, but this is a lot to get out there. Next week, the Sioux Falls Choir is going to be here. Uh, they're going to be leading both services. After this service, the ones that aren't helping, some of them are helping over there. After, after this service, the youth are putting on a, a luncheon as a fundraiser downstairs, and some of the Sioux Falls Choir is going to be there afterwards to be part of it with you. And then, uh, and then the next week, we have a gentleman coming from the uh, National Min uh, Home Mission Society, they call it again, uh, or Home Ministries. Uh, he has some stuff he wants to share with us, but there's some. I also got to visiting and talking to Ron, Robin a little bit about this man. Eddie Cruz is his name, and he has some really neat things to share. So I really encourage you not to miss that. The next week, we're doing a baptism, and so uh, that's the 24th. And so if you know somebody that's interested, or, or maybe you haven't been baptized yet, you'd, you'd like to talk about that, that's, that's for that week. And then, of course, the last weekend is, a, is that uh, uh, retreat that we're having. So lots going on. So with all of that, um, I think we will get started now. Okay. That was all preliminary. That means I got an hour from now, right? If you'd uh, stand with me, let's sing our call to worship, shall we? The Spirit song. Just the first verse. Almighty God, that's exactly what we seek today, for your Spirit to come and fill us with the fullness of Christ. Lord, may we know your power, may we know your love, your grace, and your mercy as we share together today in our worship of you. In Jesus' name, amen. So take time and say hello to some old acquaintances you haven't seen for a while.
Have everyone just remain standing, and we'll start with hymn number 611, He Hideth My Soul, verses 1 and 4. Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of His love and covers me there with His hand and covers me there with His hand. When clothed in His brightness, transported I rise to meet Him in clouds in the sky. His perfect salvation, His wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of His love and covers me there with His hand and covers me there with his hand. And next to hymn number 620, Under His Wings, verses 1 and 2. Under His wings I am safely abiding, Though the night deepens and tempests are wild, Still I can trust Him, I know He will keep me. He has redeemed me, and I am His child. Under His wings, under His wings, who from His love can serve. Under His wings, my soul shall abide, safely abide forever. Under His wings, what a refuge on sorrow, how the heart yearningly turns to his rest. Often when earth has no balm for my healing, then I find comfort and there I am blessed. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever. Under his wings my soul shall abide, safely abide forever. And hymn number 549, Higher Ground, we'll do verses 2 and 4. My heart has no desire to stay Where doubts arise and fears dismay 
Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land. A higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I pray till heaven I've found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up to let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. And uh, Sarah, uh, I can't say her last name, Gutenkunst or something. Anyway, but out of Washington School, she's, she's the lady that when we take out food supplies, actually hands them out and so works with the families directly. And she was going to come and share today, and she had something come up last minute. So, but she'll be here another week, so we're not going to do that today. So if the ushers want to come forward, we'll go ahead and do our morning offering. Uh, just a reminder, next week uh, we got the... Uh, Sioux Falls coming, and it's also daylight savings time change. So make sure you, you know, catch that before we do it. Let's bow together, shall we? Almighty God, as we come before you to bring our gifts, bring our tithes, our offerings, we, we come in recognition of all that you've done in our lives to give us even the opportunity to give. Lord, accept our love, our gifts, and our gratitude, and use them in ways that change people's lives, including our own. In Jesus' name, amen. We had some pictures, but uh, we, didn't, it didn't, we didn't get it this week. You'll get them later. Uh, but one of the things we wanted to share with you today, and this is why we have all this nasty-looking stuff over here, um, you know, we had the grant to help at Washington School, and, and we've been taking, last year we had a different grant, and we used it to help with the food supplies uh, at the end of the month. We've taken this year, the grant that we got toward the end of the year, was remember the week we brought forward the, the, all the little testing snacks that we were able to take over to Linden School and, and some of that stuff. Um, well, one of the other things we found were, were some pencil pouches. And it's kind of a funny little story, and I want to share it with you. Um, so they're, they're pouches like this, and inside they have uh, three pens, two mechanical pencils, a little uh, container with extra lead for your mechanical pencils, an eraser and a glue stick and a, ro and a ruler with the pouch. And they were on, on uh, closeout sale at the Sears when the Sears was in town. And so we had that grant money. We thought, oh, that's a good educational surprise. So we, we bought some, about, about 100 of them. And uh, they, they were, at that time, they were a little over a dollar apiece. 
And uh, we bought them, and then a few of the deacons, we got to talking amongst ourselves about, about the project and these things. And then Nola called me and told me she'd been by there and that they dropped the price. It was just like under a dollar. We thought, well, let's go back and buy some more. Because when we took them, Bob and I took them to the school, they were very excited. I mean, they instantly had a plan for what they could do with this, with the kids. Um, and so uh, I had some people say, hey, I'll donate toward that. Let's, buy, let's go, go ahead and buy some more. Went back. They dropped the price to 45 cents a piece. They were five ninety nine dollars originally. You can't buy the eraser for 45 cents. So, so we bought the rest of them. <laughs> so we got about 300. Um, then lo and behold, now we're going to talk about a deacon's meeting, but lo and behold, Washington School, what, they were want, what Diane was wanting to do with them was she says, you know, we like to send home with the kids for the summer little work packets, but a lot of times they don't have anything at home to work with. They don't have the stuff. So we wanted to use this because she said we can put the the assignments in one pocket and the other stuff in the other. And the kid, if only we had enough for more of the kids. And uh, well, if we, if, you know, there's the older kids, the younger kids. Depending on how we do it, if it's the younger kids uh, that included, then it's like 300 total they need, which we've already taken 50, so we'd have enough to cover that. Uh, if we if we do the uh, if we do uh, just the older kids and share it with Linden School as well then that would be 100, I think she said 150 or so. Uh, and we'd, so we'd be able to take a bunch of the linen. But they were so excited about something so simple. And, and, and the other thing, I, I don't want to embarrass her, so I won't say who did it. But, but I had a lady had a whole box of computer paper that she said, could they use that at the school? Well, we took that at the same time. We opened that up, and it was computer paper that had the lines on it. Remember how they used to do that? And, and, the, and the principal, when we, the second we opened that up, she says, oh my goodness, that will be perfect for handwriting. She was so excited. Um, anyway, so, so that's what we have here. Would you hold up a couple of those coats, Bob? And, uh, and we started collecting some of the coats. People are donating some money toward this. We don't necessarily have it all covered yet, but if you want to donate toward it, you can. We've got coats. We've been picking up coats on clearance. Some of the coats we've gotten as cheap as eight bucks because they're on closeout stuff. Um, so if you'd like to donate toward that, that's what the outreach thing is back at the back. Here, I want to set that with those others. Um, I just want you to see it. You know, and when, when she comes and we hear what difference it makes, just, just to know, like when we put money in the offering plate, a lot of times it's hard to figure out what, where's it really going and what's happening with it. And of course, this is a special fund this comes out of, but still to know, you know, what you're doing really is a practical thing of touching lives. Uh, the prayer request we got from the back, uh, I, I kind of had asked about earlier, Larry Raver, Patty's husband, had knee replacement surgery. As we talk about making a difference in people's lives, something just to let you know, um, we at the at a recent deacons meeting we talked about an idea of having some little postcards available that you could use that we call encouragement cards. That uh, just like if you're here some Sunday and you miss somebody or you know somebody's struggling, you want to jot them a little note. We have these yellow cards. We've got them on the table back here. That's where we'll keep them at least for now. And, and basically all it says is two, you put in there who you want to send it to, and then some lines where you can fill in your little note, and, uh, and, you, and you can put your name, who it's from is good, you don't have to, and then uh, we'll, if you want to take it home and mail it, address it yourself, you can. If you want us to mail it for you, you can leave it in the offering plate or leave it in the pew, we'll, we'll get it mailed. But, you know, when you come to church, Think about somebody that maybe could use a word of encouragement. That's, that's kind of a new thing we got, and a simple way to do it, to let somebody know you thought of them. Um, and, and, and it's kind of, 
All these things kind of fit in with what the message is about today. You know, the churches down through the years, if you go back studying church history, they've worked really hard to define what right theology is. Um, you know, what are the right teachings? What does the Bible really say? Who, who was Jesus really? What, is, what does the cross really mean? And, and uh, they've written creeds and catechisms and confessions of faith and had church constitutions with statements of belief in the front and all that kind of stuff. And, and, they, and they've taken that very seriously. Uh, and sometimes, you know, churches have, have refused to give somebody baptism until they really understood what it was or they've withdrawn communion from even kings because they weren't they weren't holding to the right teaching about things but we you know in baptists we're big about having people know their bible know the scripture we you know historically a lot of a lot of bible studies and sunday school classes uh, with all those things built into it Um, and sometimes the church has been so zealous about that that it's led to wars between Catholics and Protestants, between different groups of Protestants, different groups of Catholics. Um, and individuals who've been deemed heretics have even been, you know, tortured or killed because of that. Uh, I think of uh, a man named Michael Servetus burned alive uh, outside Geneva uh, back when John Calvin was around and helping lead things. Uh, and I like Calvin, but I sure don't like this. But because Servetus... In his, in his prayers and in his teaching, his prayers were to Jesus, the Son of the eternal God, not to Jesus, the eternal Son of God. So he was burned alive at the stake for that because he didn't, he didn't acknowledge that Jesus existed forever. You know, believing is, is, a, is an important thing and, and, and having correct beliefs, you know, and, and we try to work on that. And I and I and you know, I, I see beyond just the beliefs. There are churches that do work on their practice of church discipline too. Um, people being reprimanded. Uh, Joel and I had a conversation a while back. He ran across the thing in the history stuff when it talked about how many people were baptized and how many new members and how many people were excluded. And we were trying to figure out well, what what did it mean that they excluded? And there were a lot of them. What did it mean that they were being excluded? And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, I think what it really meant was that that they that their lives and their statements they weren't quite ready really for membership. It was kind of a half-hearted commitment, maybe, because churches have done that. You know, they've disciplined people that step out of line. They withdraw their membership. Or, or lately, we've seen in the headlines of Southern Baptists, you know, who are already in trouble because of how they treat women. There've been a lot of articles about that. Well, now they're caught in the mire about the hundreds of pastors and volunteers who've been accused of molesting some 700 or more victims for, for years and that they refuse to change their policies of tracking these people who've been accused of that, much like the Catholic Church was in trouble for that several years ago. You know, the guilty pastors and leaders are going to be forced out eventually if they haven't already. The world is watching these things. So not only at what we believe, but what we practice makes a difference as well. That's part of why our church has a policy, you know, in terms of a safety protection policy for children and other things, and why we're actually working to update it and get some shifts taken. But these things happen. You know, I, in my own life, I, I, I have known, I knew of a pastor, I knew, of, I knew him, who was in trouble, got in trouble for, for molesting a young gal, and I knew of a deacon, I knew of a junior high Sunday school teacher, you know, similar crimes. And then other churches, you know, we, we think about, about the struggle we had with the uh, money that was stolen from our church last, last fall and, and, and the years preceding, but we're not the only church that's had that. I've heard lots of stories about that. It, it, I mean, I've, I've known that happens. You know, what we practice, it isn't just that we believe correctly, it's also that we practice correctly. But there's an area, one area, in Scripture that it, it seems to me is hammered on time and time again in the Bible. And yet, a lot of times when we talk about, about what we practice, um, it's, not, it's not emphasized so much. And yet in Scripture, it's a dominant theme, especially in the Hebrew prophets. 
as they, as they tried to apply God's teaching to their nation of Israel and Judah. And, and it's a theme that Jesus picked up on as well in a variety of ways. And as I was thinking about today, and especially thinking Sarah might be able to come from the school, I thought, you know, it happens also to be an area that is a church we've been involved in lately, in our ministry with Washington School or, or what was known as Care Corps, and they're working on their new name. You know, often throughout the scriptures, throughout the history, throughout the ages, in Christian, the Jewish teachers, there's been this emphasis to understand properly the commandments and the teachings and the biblical teachings of God. And sometimes we focus too much on that, I think. And we focus on behaviors that are significant to us. But I think sometimes we miss this theme that is peppered throughout the Scripture. So I want us to focus on it today. And I want to read, read, verse read out of Isaiah 58 because that's where the core passage is for the day. Isaiah 58, starting in verse 2. Yet they seek me daily, talking about his people, and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation of righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. You know, that could be said today, real easy, of, of a lot of churches. And they say, why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose? A day for a person to humble himself. Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then shall your lights break forth like the dawn. And your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then if you shall call, the Lord will answer you. And you shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt and you shall raise up the foundation of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. You know, today we're holding a worship service. We have a time of prayer, we have our offering time, we sing songs, religious songs to God. And today especially we're going to do participate in that most special ceremony, the communion together. But it's important, I think, that as we go through these things, as we seek out the correct teachings of Scripture, we recognize that perhaps in God's sight, it may well be that none of those are the most important thing we do. It may well be that the most important thing we do relates to those little pencil bags or to the little bags of food that we take over to the school. Because by those things, we're aligning ourselves with the fast that God chooses in Isaiah 58. And not just by those deeds. You know, but our support of missions, like, like what I saw when I was with J.D. down in Bolivia or when I was with Walt White in Bangladesh or with Annie Dieselberg or Bank, our missionaries... Or, or even at Bethel Neighborhood Center down in Kansas City or Moreau Indian Children's Home down in Oklahoma. These are some of the ways that we are supporting ministries to some of the poorest people of the world. And those are representative of the ministries that we support around the globe through all the various mission offerings we do. And verse 7 says, 
sharing our bread with the hungry. And each month we've taken out a little bag, not a lot, but a little bag of food to people that didn't have food on their shelves. Providing warm clothing. You saw the coats Bob held up. Even those simple little educational supplies, it's our way of making sure that the ceremonies, that the worship, that the things we do here in the sanctuary are not just activities that we do here, but they're also lived out in, in action out in the community, the way we treat other people. The other verse for the day is out of Matthew 25, um, and it's a passage you probably have heard. It also is the passage that is the name of the grant that we received that, that's funded doing the testing snacks and, and, and some of these educational things and some books and things. Um, and here's, here's how it goes. This is what Jesus said, Matthew 25, starting at 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels come with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd se she separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on His right, but the goats on His left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you? or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. I want to ask the question in kind of the simplest of ways. If Jesus walked in right now and sat down right next to you and he didn't have a coat, clearly was cold, didn't have any gloves, didn't have anything to eat when he went home, told you he hadn't had breakfast because there wasn't any food on the shelf like the little boy told us at the art day last summer. What would you be willing to do to help him if it was Jesus sitting right there? If you happen to be around the temple when Jesus was 12 years old and you heard him talking with the teachers as he was trying to learn but you saw that he didn't have a pencil and that his family was struggling to provide breakfast in the morning or supper over the weekend, how would you feel about going home to a full pantry and freezer or stopping with friends for a nice meal after church, knowing that that little boy Jesus was going to go home to nothing? Would the $5 or the $20 bill in your wallet find its way into the hands of Mary and Joseph. I mean, I think most of us would like to think we would. You know, because, we, because it's Jesus, right? And, and then another question, if you did give Mary and Joseph that 20 bucks, what strings would you attach to it? Would you say, okay, we'll give this to you, but only if you come to church Sunday? Or would you, would you help only if he spoke the same language that you spoke? Or only if he came and begged for help. I'm not going to go out of my way to help him. What are the strings we would put on something like that? And remembering, of course, that this is Jesus. The Jesus who died on the cross to pay for our sins. Who gave his very life for us. So that you and I could be forgiven and go to heaven and, and not take the punishment that he took on our behalf. That's who we're talking about in this scenario who might need that coat or some pencils or some food to take home to eat. What would, you, what would you do if it was Jesus sitting next to you with that need? I think that's an important question. I think that's part of what Isaiah is trying to say. I think that's part of what Jesus is trying to say. Because from God's perspective, that's what happens every time a young child at that school or in our Wednesday night club puts on a coat that you donated or a pair of gloves that you helped pay for or took home a little bag of food for a shelf that has nothing. Every time. 
you helped Jesus. You might remember that Jesus was wandering the countryside, you know, in his ministry with his disciples. The one time he pointed out to him, he was homeless. He says, the foxes have dens, I don't. You know, talk about laying your head on a rock. So Jesus has a real and meaningful personal connection with every person who enters the doors over there at Carecor. I got to get that new name down. Carecor is what I stick with. I, but that's also what happens with every person who comes to Carecor when we're over there, who eats some biscuits and gravy, or drinks that glass of chocolate milk because we came and helped serve, or when a child at Linden or picks up a pencil that says First Baptist on it because they didn't have a pencil of their own, or when he takes a test and gets hungry and the teacher hands him a little granola bar, or when she goes home with a pencil pouch like one of those so she can do homework that she maybe couldn't do otherwise. It's Jesus who says thank you, whether they do or not, you see. Because as far as Jesus is concerned, you actually did it to him. We often see these people, but Jesus doesn't look at it that way. He looks at it as having been done for him. Isaiah says that this is the very fast that God chooses. It's the kind of faith that God wants us to practice. It's true faith. It isn't just taking communion or singing songs on Sunday. And Jesus says even a cup of cold water given in his name does not go unnoticed. You know, I don't know which activity of our church's outreach you, you're involved in personally, whether it's with your prayers or your finances or things you buy and donate or ones that you come and participate. I don't know which. I mean, everybody has different things you do. But make no mistake, when you participate in things like that, you are doing something that is very, very important. More important, I think, than most of us realize. Don't let your vision get limited by what you see on earth. Instead, take hold of the heavenly perspective because one day when you approach the heavenly throne, you may find Jesus approaches you and says, you remember those gloves you donated that winter? Thank you. My hands were warm because you gave a pair of gloves. Oh yeah, I, I wore them using the name Jeff or Julie or Carlos or Maria, but I've been wanting to wait until you came here so that I could personally tell you thanks because you did it for me. The America for Christ offering is coming up. One Great Hour Sharing, World Mission Offering, our Outreach Fund. That's just a few of the ways that we have opportunity to make this kind of a difference. But right now, this year, I just want to share as well, as we move forward with the food we're trying to provide to Washington's neediest, you know, there's a flyer in the, in the bulletin as well that talks about, that mentions the need of, of, uh, of having the, the food staples. Uh, maybe you might want to consider adopting a month. We don't do it through the summer. Um, it's like $220 a month, roughly. And that, that's these basic supplies for about 50 families, and they appreciate it. Maybe you want to adopt one month or part of a month, or part of the cost. You know, we, we had donations for January and February, so we've already delivered out there. We've got, we've got pledges promised if they haven't given it. I don't know if they've given it all yet. Future provision is going to be based on future donations. But beyond the little bags of food, I really want to understand this about us as a church. That we do, as we do these various things, and there's a bunch of them we do, that these are Jesus' opportunity. It isn't just about that we're touching the lives in the community. It is about that, but it's bigger than that. God has placed within our grasp these Jesus opportunities to participate. And when we participate and we touch lives for Christ in His name and we follow the teaching of Scripture to care about those in need, listen to the promise again that's in Isaiah. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, 
and your healing shall spread up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer you. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as the noonday, and the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you, you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. You know, God promises to honor those who pay attention to these kinds of needs. And I think in an extremely self-centered age filled with narcissism and people looking out for number one, God's promise to honor those who look beyond themselves is a big deal. I hope you'll grasp today that our efforts in these things aren't merely helping somebody in our community. They're deeds of eternal significance, and not just for them, but for us as well. They may, in fact, be the most important things that we do as a church. I don't know. Because it is the fast that God chooses. And because I believe the answer to Cain's question is actually, yes, we are our brother's keeper. Let's pray. God, these people are sitting here in front of me today, and many of them have been at a lot of these activities, trying to show your love. Many of them have offered money to help with the various needs. And as a result, we've been able to do a lot of things in your name. Lord, I pray that you help us as we do these things together. Help us to never forget how personally you take it. Help us to never forget that the real purpose is to honor you, to reach lives for you. Most of all, Lord, I, I hold up that promise you made that when we try to do these things to the best of our ability, that, that you promise that your glory is going to rise in our midst. We're going to see the dawn. We're going to see our prayers answered. We're going to see a difference, not just there, but in our own lives and in the life of our church. Lord, thank you that even though we didn't get to walk with you while you were wandering around there in Israel, that we can still minister in a way that you take as having been done to you personally in some of the simple things we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn today, invitation hymn, I guess I should call it, uh, also from the 1890s. Let's just do the first verse of number 668 so we can get on to communion, shall we? Stand with me as we sing. Number 668, I'll go where you want me to go, even if it's to Washington School with a bag of clothes.
You know, I want you to know, I take that song seriously. You know, when I ask people to do stuff, a lot of times they'll say, I want you to pray about it first. You know, not everybody's going to do all the different things we do as a church. Not everybody's going to get on board with this project or that project. But if you're all doing what God wants you to do and going where he wants you to go, isn't that all we need to do? You know, we each have a role, and it may not be the same as somebody else, but what a wonderful song. Why don't you be seated? Let's sing our, uh, we'll do our communion song together and get ready for communion. Number, we're going to do 461 verses 1 and 2. Um, and I, if I remember right, this is the one that kind of gives us a little hard time. Let him in. Nope. That's after. That's after. I told you this is the one we have a hard time with. We kind of interrupt it. In remembrance of me. Of all the things we do as a church. Of all the studies. Of all the fellowship. All the songs. To me, this is the key. We do this in remembrance of Him. We do this to remind ourselves of who it is that did everything for us. Right? Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus on the night when He was betrayed took bread. When He had given thanks, He broke it. said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. You know, we... we we don't believe like some churches all sorts of things happen with this, but we do believe it's important. We do believe it's a special time between you and God and that God meets us and we remember together how much He gave for us. If you're here today, you're not a member of this church or even if you're just visiting, we don't care. You know, you, you are welcome. This is the Lord's table. And if you and God are in touch and you've done the examining yourself and you know, we invite you to be part of this because we all come to this table together, remembering the one who made it possible. says that in the night which Jesus betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And then he gave thanks. Let's pray. God, we thank you for what this means. The broken body so that ours could be forgiven. By his stripes we are healed within, throughout, for all eternity. 
and we remember today. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Eat all of you from it. It says that in the same way after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it. Let's pray. Lord, as we take this cup, we, we ask your blessing on it and upon our participation in it. May it enrich our lives, renew our spirits, and help us to remember that blood that was shed for our cleansing. In Jesus' name, amen.
Yes, sir. Jesus said, this is my blood shed for you. Drink, all of you, from it. It says, afterwards they went out singing a hymn to face the next day to face whatever life brought, and they had no idea what was coming, but Jesus did. We go out singing a hymn too. We don't know what's coming either, but Jesus does. Let's stand, sing together the last part of, of our In Remembrance, beginning with Take, Eat. For those of you going for cookies, I happen to know that the circle that had it for today, that stuff's in there, but they weren't here to serve, so I don't know who all's doing what. Then you may have to do a little helping to make that happen. Let's pray. God, I'm so thankful these folks are here today. I'm thankful that we were able to get out and come together and worship, and, and you, most of all, welcomed us. Lord, help us as we seek to welcome you in our lives day by day. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.